Today what we're going to do is, last year we did a presentation almost identical to this. It was on starters and generators. This year, rather than just trying to give you some information, we're going to give you a little bit of enticement to come back in October. And I'm going to get the presentation started. I'll give you a little more information about that. Okay, the Model T generator, we're going to try to figure out why it stops doing what it's supposed to do. Has anyone in here ever tried to adjust their generator charge rate and end up with a generator that doesn't work? Okay, well that's pretty typical with the old insulator. So as you can see this guy on the bottom, hopefully you can see him okay, he's pulling his hair out and you can see most of mine are gone too, so it's pretty typical. But what, what today is about is basically about a upcoming event at the Model T Museum in our new workshop here. Thanks to Tony and a bunch of guys, we have a wonderful workshop. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to go look at it. There will be additional generator equipment coming in October, which we're going to be uh, loaning to the museum on long-term loan. So anyway, we've done this before, and this, is, um, this was done a couple years ago at my home, and what we do this is actually Jerry Kramer's hands. Probably can't see this very well, but we actually put assembly teams together. We have five tables. We try to have six guys at every table. And I bring all brand new generator equipment already cleaned up, new armatures, new everything. And then we have assembly teams put them together. And as we're putting them together, we go through the problems that a generator can, can, uh, can have and it, the light will stop working. Well, at the end of the day, if all goes well, we'll have five brand new generators working. At that point, we're not here to sell anything, but at that point, if anybody needs one, they get it just for the, uh, whatever the parts are in the generator. Unfortunately, the generator, as compared to the starter, eats up a lot of parts. So a generator is a very expensive piece of equipment to restore. It has, with an armature, a brand new armature rewind, it's probably over $220 in parts. But when it's done, it's brand new. It's back to the way it should be. One of the major problems that a generator goes through is that it's been in existence usually since 1919. The, the youngest wood would, would have come out in 1927. Still, that's 91 years ago. So, maybe that's wrong. Yeah, 91 years ago. So they're still an extremely old piece of equipment. Now, that's not to say that they probably won't work. And if they're in your car and they're working, that's great. But as a rebuilder, we take them from, from the phase one all the way through, totally clean. You can eat off one when we're done. Everything works the way it's supposed to. The Model T received an upgrade in 1919. Actually, the Cadillac in 1912 came out with a self-starter and a lighting system. And, um, sorry, I got derailed here for me. Uh, came out with a starter. Henry didn't think he needed one, so in 1919 he was finally convinced that we needed better headlights and we needed a starter. So at that point, the starter lighting system came out. It was developed by this man in the left-hand corner. His name was Fred Allison. He worked for Ford. He was one of their major electrical engineers. He designed both parts. Actually, for a very short while, it was called the FA starting and lighting system. Well. If you work for Ford, that is not going to last very long. FA stands for Fred Allison. It soon became Ford. So, uh, but this is the gentleman. He's actually in a, in a Tesla of the day. That's a Ford uh, test car. It's, it's run on batteries. They never did that, but that was some of the stuff that they did even back then. So let's talk about the generator just a little bit. I touched on one place where I said the generator is, is, is an old piece of equipment. Well, when it was originally designed, it was very rugged, just like the rest of the Model T car, and pretty much trouble-free. But over the last 90 years, and a lot of patches, and a lot of people, and a lot of drivers, it's less than uh, desirable now. Let's put that into perspective. You've got a 90-year-old to 100-year-old radio, and you plug it in. Chances are you're going to see smoke. Now, there are some chances that maybe it'll work, but I wouldn't rely on it every day just like a generator. I wouldn't rely on it every day as well. So, if you got one that's frustrating, we're going to show you a few things, but it's usually going to take bringing the generator back to square one to get it to where it's going to be reliable again. 
Um, most of what I'm going to show you here today, and I apologize for a little bit on the bottom, there's a lot of words up there. Um, most of what I'm going to show you today was shared to, uh, with me by Ron Patterson. I know you've all heard uh, with Ron, of Ron. His name is the Coil Man. I'm the Coil Doctor. We're good friends. We talk once or twice a month, so we have no, uh, there's no competition between us. But he's, uh, he does far more of these than I do, but this is his process. One of the biggest problems in generators, you have to remember that a generator runs the entire time the car runs. It's unlike the starter, the starter runs for a few short bursts and it's over with. The generator runs all the time. The generator also builds heat. When, it makes gener when it's making electricity, the higher amperage it's putting out, the more heat it's going to ge generate as well. We got to make sure that we got a good quality bearing in there. If you're using a bearing from 1919, I would encourage you not to use that. I would say put a sealed bearing in. A sealed bearing doesn't require any lubrication anymore. It may require a few things which we will touch on when we get into the generator workshop here, as far as getting the end play and things like that. So a lot of things I can't tell you today, so that's why I'm trying to entice you to come in October. It is going to be probably limited to 30 people simply because it's hard to get everybody on the same page, so we have to keep the size down. It is a lot of fun. There will be a lunch involved, so it will probably be somewhere between 10 and 3, because it does take a while to do this, even though we've got all the parts cleaned up. I do ask that if you're going to come, do not bring any dirty generators, because that's not what we're going to be able to do. We're going to go through some of the dirty generator stuff, but I can't do that when we're here. We're putting together brand new stuff and we're going to make sure it works and you're going to see the little nuances of why putting even brand new stuff together won't work properly either. So uh, we're going to, it's a, it's a fun day. I'm not going to lecture. We're going to walk around and help you assemble parts and probably the biggest part of the generator that is so important and I had a gentleman raised his hand a few minutes ago why the generator stopped working when I tried to increase the amperage rate. This little part right here is the culprit. This is the brush plate has three brushes, one is movable, two are stationary. This is before, this is after. This is what they will look like when we're done. This little brush plate, when what usually happens is the paper insulator, which is basically a very crude phenolic paper of some sort, it's cracking and whenever it cracks, then what happens, one of the lugs will ground to the terminal. Now the generator's incapable of making power because it's also grounded and that problem is right here on this little brush right here. This is your third brush on this one, it's right here. That's the one that's adjustable. No doubt when you adjusted it, you broke the insulator, you probably couldn't even tell. Now it's grounded, it, can't, it cannot generate. So that's one place that we will rebuild. We'll probably spend a half an hour or 45 minutes in the rebuild just rebuilding that. And I'm gonna have a lot of it pre-done to save some time, but again, I'm trying to entice you to come. The other part that is really, um, if you're going to do it right, I encourage you to do the armature, have it rewound. Again, it's 90 to 100 years old. It's been spinning in there for that long. It's time to get it redone. And there's reasons you want to do that too. You, you also could have a, an armature that's grounded to the shaft. If the commutator is grounded to the shaft, again, it's incapable of, of putting out power. We'll show you how to use a growler, show you how to uh, make sure the windings don't have a short inside. Occasionally, though, an armor or a generator will work for a while until it warms up. What happens is it, as it warms up, it expands a little and it's creating a short inside. It's called a flying short, nothing, nothing magical about it. Again, if you've got a generator that's on and off and on and off and on and off while you're driving, that's probably what's going on. Unless you've got a voltage regulator and then, <laughs> then that's what it's supposed to do. Um, one of the things we're going to do, and this is strictly, you know, once we get through my workshop, then you'll be able to pick and choose what you want to do on your own particular one. I always use new fields. They're just easier. They're cleaner to deal with. We take the old ones out. If anybody wants them, I'll bring them. But uh, they are able to be rewrapped, but I don't want to fool with them. The new ones are just fine. So those will be, we put in and we'll have the correct equipment to show you how to seat those. We have a pull shoe screwdriver that we're bringing. We're bringing all the generator tools so you'll be able to work with actually the tools that are in the 1925 service manual. So, and we'll bring that as well. And we're going to share a little bit about the equipment as we do that. And the interesting part about Ford is 
the equipment made for the Ford workshops was made for the Ford workshops. The generator tester we're going to be using was made strictly for the Model T generator. That's why it's neat. You just plug it in with the gear and everything and you can go test it and then you go from there. And so those parts are very, very important. And a lot of guys may wonder, okay, when you take the uh, field windings out, what about the pole shoes? Do I have to mark it? No, we're going to run you through all of that as well. When you put the new fields in, we just give them a little bit of power from the battery and those poles will realign themselves through the field windings. Very quick, very easy. So you don't have to worry about marking anything when you take it apart. Actually, you can build a generator from a pile of parts, of, again, interchangeable parts. You can put one together, very little problem. Another part that's sometimes missed is you have to seat the brushes properly. I'm not gonna go into the next slide in detail, but it is so important that you get 90 to 95% contact of the brush to the commutator. You can't just throw the brushes in, and we have a way that I want to show you that is so much easier than what they show you in the Ford manual. Um, I'm going to see if I can I'm going to explain this. I didn't bring a, an armature, but what we do is we take the commutator, which is the, brat, the, the copper part of the armature, clean it all up, and we cut the slots. Again, we're going to be doing that that day. You have to cut the slots on the generator, and we'll use an actual generator armature undercut saw. Uh, it's called a true cut. We'll cut those so you can see what that's all about. They must be perfectly clean in between the slots. After we get that done, what we do is we take a piece of sandpaper and we actually use a double-sided tape and tape that directly to the armature commutator. Put it back in, drop the brushes, and we spin that on those new brushes, eight or ten spins. Now those brushes should be and will be perfectly fit to that particular armature. You're not trying to put a set of brushes in. They show in the Ford manual where you try to fix them with a little piece of sandpaper. No, we're going to put them in so they're 90 to 95 percent in contact. And the reason, and you, what you're going to find out when we start spinning the generator, you're going to see very little sparking of the brushes, almost nothing. And that means that your brushes are seated properly. Now, once the generator starts running, you'll see a little bit of carbon transfer to the, to the armature. That's typical. But this is another process that we're going to go through more in detail if you come. Again, I want you to come. Like I said before, the Model T generator is a hog for parts. It's a very expensive piece to put together. Parts with armature run around $220. So it's not a cheap fix, but once you do it and you do it correctly, it's done. Okay, unless you do something where the battery comes disconnected. If the battery ever comes disconnected from the start, from the generator, then the generator will run wild and it'll burn itself up. So that's the only way that probably you're going to destroy one of these new ones once we're done with it. Again, when, we, when you come, all of these, uh, there will be handouts with all these parts numbers where you can get them if you're interested in going into generator work uh, on your own. I encourage you to do that. There's a lot of people out there that need help with them and they kind of look like there's a little bit of mystique that there's something hard about them. There really isn't. It's just doing them and using a process. Um, I want to show you a few tools that we're going to show you. Last year I drug all these tools, but I didn't bring them today. We'll be bringing all this when we come. Um, this is the pole shoe screwdriver. This is what we use to seat the pole shoes and the new windings back up in. They have to be extremely tight and they have to be within spec or the armature will hit them. And if the armature hit them, hits them, we're not going to make electricity. So. And then um, we have an expander here, which makes that job somewhat easier. You can get it at Harbor Freight. It's one of the few tools that I say oh, I get at Harbor Freight that you can use. It's the large muffler expander, and it works great. Just keep cranking it down. You will probably have to set the screws twice. But once you get them in there, you stake them in place, you're usually good to go. We do also have uh, uh, what's called a no-go, no no-go gauge, go no-go gauge, sorry. And what it does, you can slide it in between the pole shoes before you actually enter the armature and you know that you're correct. It's got two steps on it. It should go and click against the one step, which means it's too far. But again, you gotta come and see all the good toys. Um, we'll show you a gear puller. We'll show you about putting on the oil slinger again, which if anyone out there is doing generators and you're throwing your oil slinger away just because you put a sealed bearing in, I recommend you don't because it's another deterrent from oil entering the generator. That It's a little cup washer that goes right under the gear and it throws oil out from the centrifugal force. Ford designed it because they didn't have a sealed bearing. 
We still use it because even though you've got a sealed bearing, it's one more deterrent. You get oil away from the generator because it's really kind of a bad design being in the oil path. And you all knew that. This is the tester that we will be donating to the, uh, well, we will be long-term loaning to the museum. It's an Allen generator tester, and it is, it is purpose-built for the Model T generator. So it's very easy to use. It's got everything you need. It's got a growler, it's got the amp meter. It's a perfect little machine. Um, and then what you're going to see at the end of the day is, I don't know if you can hear it or not, but this, this is what one should look like. And if you notice, we're up here about 67 amps, nice and smooth needle. And at the end of the day, that's what we will see. This is the tester in work, uh, working. You probably can't see, but there's no brush sparking at all. Nothing sparking on the armature. So, do I have, I wanted to thank you today for your attendance, but do I have any questions? I know this was kind of quick today. But it was, uh, it was meant to just entice, not to really instruct as much today. Anybody have any quick questions? Yes, sir. Do you have the exact date? I'm sorry. For October? Do you have the exact date? The date. The date. The date. Oh, the date. I'm sorry. October 23rd. And there will be, I'm sorry. There will be some, um, I thought there was going to be registration forms today, but you will be seeing more about it. Okay. And uh, I believe there will be, um, since there's going to be a lunch furnished, there will be like a $15 registration fee, but it's October 23rd. It'll be right here. I'm not sure if it's here or there or wherever. But it'll be a fun day. Now, it's, if you're coming, it's going to be 10 to 3. We might get done a little earlier. We may not. So it depends on how the workflow goes. And we do do a little bit of pre-assembly just to make it a little quicker, but very little. Because I want you guys to feel what, what I'm feeling and try to show you. So. Any other questions? I, like I said, I do encourage you to come because it's a fun day. We've done it at my home. We did it at Tony's shop one day, and we had a lot of fun. Uh, it's just a good time whenever we can get together. Have any more? Any questions? Yes, sir. What type of cutout do you recommend? Well, the cutout, depending on how you drive, if you drive a lot, I would recommend the voltage regulator. If you don't drive ex extreme amounts, I would just recommend taking an old Ford cutout and putting a diode in it. And if you need the correct diode, see me, I can send you one. They're about $10. Uh, I don't recommend the ones they have in the Model C catalog. They're not, they're too hard to deal with. Uh, they make a little top hat. But if you're going to, if you, if you drive, let's say, a couple times a week, the diode is fine. But if you drive a lot on tours and whatnot, you're going to boil your battery drive. You don't use a voltage regulator. Also allows your generator to rest for a while. But uh, you've got to be careful putting the voltage regulator on. You've got to definitely follow the instructions. But yeah, I definitely would recommend staying away from the old contact type cutout. If they stick, you're going to have a, either a burn-up generator or burn-up battery or something. So just stay away from those. Yes, sir? What about the concept of running a grounding wire? That's a possibility if you want to do that, where you can actually turn it off. Yes, I've heard of guys doing that. I personally don't drive to extent that extent, but uh, yeah, that's definitely a doable thing just to ground it so you turn it off. And that's fine if you're on long tours. I, yeah, the generator can rest because they do build an awful lot of heat. And that's what you usually see in a generator is cause all the problems, is excessive heat. And then if you set a generator uh, beyond 7 or 8 amps, it's running way too hot anyway. Uh, it's basically a 100 watt generator, so if you figure the amperage out, it's around 6 or 7 amps. If you're, running on, if you're charging a 12 volt battery with that, you need to cut that down as well. Otherwise, you're going to burn up the generator. So. And they will charge 6 or 12 volts very easily. You just have to remember that the charge rate needs to be adjusted for 12 volt battery. Down. Uh, mount, three, mount 3 amps. So, if there's any, any other, no other questions, I'm going to turn you over to Tony then. Thank you for listening.